there are the, the, the three categories for uh, the, the, uh, the online risks. So one is the illegal and harmful content risks. The second one is inappropriate use of risk. And the third one is privacy and security risk. So uh, these three risks uh, can be uh, separated, broken down into the uh, many subcategories. But the, uh, the, I think this is a very good uh, um, categorization and to help us to understand, uh, to have a common understanding of the, what kind of the risks we, have, we are facing or the use are facing. So uh, uh, this is only one. So, and the, uh, the other one is the uh, Japanese government uh, is trying to have uh, indicator of the, which sort of the risks is uh, currently the most one, or the, the second one, the three one, and the annually which which risk of these three categories are growing or mitigating. So uh, this, this sort of the effort is very, very essential for us to have a collaborative uh, work to protect our child and youth. 70% of the youth has the, uh, a very positive opinion against the protecting themselves. So uh, such and such, and uh, so uh, what is highlight, what should be highlighted now is youth or children should be responsible for protecting themselves, all right? So uh, of course we can do, as adult people can do anything, something to, to, to protecting them. But the most important thing is to, uh, to, to uh, let them encourage, encourage them to have uh, opinion and the positive uh, positive action to protect themselves. So this is what, I, what we have learned by indexing the, the demographic, the, the risks of the, uh, the, uh, the children cyberspace. Okay, so uh, this, I will spend a few minutes to highlight the, the other experience from Japan which is from the Yahoo Japan Corporation, which is the Mochizuki, so, uh, Mr. Mochizuki's con company. So uh, there, we have the Safer Internet Association uh, in Japan, and this is uh, uh, the member of the uh, INHOP, International Association of Internet Hotlines. So uh, maybe you are very familiar with. And the, uh, these are the, uh, the, the membership is coming from the uh, many, many uh, Japanese companies, including Yahoo and Trend Micro and Mixi, uh, Amazon and Cyber Agent. So uh, the, we, are, we have a collaborative teamwork in Japan to uh, quickly respond to the, the any risks of the ch child or youth. So uh, you might be, you might not be able to look into this chat, but the, I just wanted to say this is a combination of the um, various stakeholders. So not only the, these companies in Japan, but also the, the, the youth themselves and government and teachers, many, many stakeholders are accessing this SIA, Safer Internet Association, and given the many information. So this, all the information are collected and the feedback to the others. So uh, the, this sort of the collaborative platform is very, very essential. This is a message to IGF organizers probably i'm a bit disappointed by not having ma made more efforts to bring in people to really li listen to youth i mean we have youth representatives and i don't know where are the people listening to youth so but okay i'm gonna start and then i can complain more formally to igf with you together maybe i think we should make a statement actually for next year because youth is here they made the effort and we need people to listen to them.
We have the impression that the next billion users are these kind of people, highly educated, coming from different continents, with access to technology, with very modern devices. Um, I think that's a bit diff it, it's, it's dangerous to talk about the next billion users and at the same time having international organization fostering universal, affordable access in least developed countries. This is a target. By 2020, we, the world wants to have connectivity everywhere. And that means the next billion users. But when we provide connectivity, when we provide universal access, and when we make it universal, there are also potential risks. And I think it's very important to be aware of what happens when you bring connectivity, when you bring the internet, and when you bring access to the regions, to regions of the world where they are dealing with other much more important challenges. And I just got this um, graph from the World Development Indicators and UNESCO, and you can see that the highest amount of cell, uh, cell phone subscriptions do not match at all literacy rate. So you have in the poorest countries, lots of people with access to the internet now, to cell phones, but these people do not even know how to read. They don't even know how to write. So I think that we should also take into consideration what is the other phase of the next billion users. But it's also very important to work closely with the police because the police need to be able to um, support that child, find the child in the picture, and hopefully rescue it. So it's not just about taking the content down from the internet, which needs to be done in a, in a legal, in a proper way, so that we don't affect any other types of, we don't interfere with human rights, with freedom of expression, that we are really sure that what is taken down is only criminal activity, but also that we can save and support uh, a child. So that's what in hope does, and, and this is um, how we work, and this is why we believe that it's so important that we have an international organization and mechanisms in place to work internationally. So um, currently, we have 53 hotlines. We are present in 46 countries. Our members include all types of organizations, from governmental organizations to NGOs, internet service providers. Uh, we have 200 analysts working right now um, all over the world, and they are all trained uh, by, um, by InHope, and also uh, we work together with, the, with Interpol uh, and uh, with Europol as well in, in, in Europe. And, uh, and what we do is uh, we have an, an, an association where it's like where all our members work together, but we also have a foundation to support the development of hotlines around the world. And we believe that it's a very important task of InHope to reach the regions, to reach the countries where we are not there yet. And so today I will be talking about um, how internet safety education has failed in DRC and the need for more action. So expect me to tell you uh, what are the challenges that we're having in a country uh, as big as I think uh, Eastern Europe and what we need to do we need partnership with uh, people like you. The DRC we are currently at 3.6 percentage of penetration of internet rate penetration which as you can see it's still very low and someone will, will think maybe because there is uh, internet is still very low in that country probably there is less issues of uh, safety for young people who are having a lot of challenges and I'll be mentioning some of them one of the challenges is access to the electricity that's that's uh, that's really really huge a huge issue in the country because you cannot imagine accessing the internet even if if you can't have at least access to electricity you will not able, be able to charge your mobile phone. You will not, not be able to charge your computer. And so uh, that's one of the challenges uh, we're having, not only as young people, but uh, as everyone internet user in the country. We also have like an issue with the challenge uh, with regarding infrastructure. Internet infrastructure is still very low, and we are really pushing for the government or any private sector company to really, really invest in building our infrastructure. Because we cannot think of connecting the next billion if we don't invest in, you know, uh, building the infrastructure, which will will allow will help people, you know, to have access to the internet. There is an African uh, saying that says, if if you fail to get an education in your family, the society or the community will take care of it. 
And when they're saying that, that's, that doesn't mean that they expect the community or the society to give you the right education you need. But so many of the fake education that people, young people receive in, in, is coming from the community. Because there you have like a different type of people. Some of those who are corrupted morally, some of those who are, those who are involved in child pornography or those who are involved in all those uh, bad things that young people can expect to get online. And so how can you expect to, to send your kids? If you don't educate your kids at home, how they can best use the internet? I know Inhop is in the room. I know Yahoo Japan is in the room. I know uh, so many people here coming from different backgrounds or information. We really, really need to educate the future digital citizens and help them create a safer online environment. We really need it before it's too late. Because if we talk on connecting the next billion to the internet, and if we don't start today educating them on how they can be safe online, we'll be bringing so many people online, but we'll be only advocating for a lot of harm more than a lot of good for them. We often hear we live in an age of data. Our speech acts, our shopping, our work, and so many aspects of our lives intersect with and depend on digital communications platforms, which generate huge amounts of data on a daily basis. Every click, every tap, every swipe. And yet we do that on what we often hear is, an, is a network that wasn't designed for security. The security of that data and of our trust in using the platforms we use relies in part on encryption which protects, among other things, the confidentiality, the integrity, the authenticity, and the availability of information. And if we also understand that those same properties are central to cybersecurity, or the preservation of information and the network's underlying infrastructure, then encryption is not only central to the enjoyment of our, of our rights, but to the very use of the internet itself. But what many human rights defenders point out is that these measures undermine the rights to privacy and to freedom of expression by exposing personal data to unwanted access and increasing the vulnerability of data to malicious actors. Plenty of our data right now remains unencrypted so that it might be used by tech companies in the course of their business. And with due process and proper procedure, I think there are times when it's appropriate for tech companies to share what they know. Um, when law enforcement, for example, has a legal right to that information. And it was interesting to read in the, in the recent UNESCO uh, report on human rights and encryption. It said that encryption, generally speaking, is necessary but not sufficient to protect people and sensitive information in a networked world. So I thought about that. Okay, well, if it's not enough, it's necessary but not sufficient, what else could we possibly have? to give us these protections that we need, the protections that the technology alone cannot provide? And the answer is our laws and our institutions. But there was something that, that I heard this week in another workshop that really struck with me, which is the practical side of this. If governments have no efficient and thus auditable and you know, process, a process that can be monitored for obtaining a data about people, and again, obtaining this data only under due process, when warranted, not in bulk surveillance. If they don't have a process that is actually respected and nurtured, they will often hack their way into systems that hold this data. And we know they will do that. We've seen it done. They will install malware that facilitates surveillance that they feel they cannot get through other means. And that has far worse consequences for human rights. And transparency is diminished in that scenario. I think that it's important that we keep asking the question not whether something is good for privacy, full stop, um, but we need to also ask how that meshes with our other values. Is it good for democracy? Is it good for civic engagement? Is it good for human rights? And I think we should strive to nurture and reform processes by which law enforcement can, at times, obtain what we're calling consumer data. And it's not in conflict with our right to encryption. So ideally, technology will work to strengthen these civic institutions rather than undermine them. Thank you. I think that, um, first of all, uh, we have to think about safeguards around getting access to data. If you look from historical perspective, interception of communications, which is also data, is data, or interception of letters, exists as long as uh, criminal use phones 
or correspondence to communicate with each other. Um, according to existing telecom regulations in many countries, providers have to capture the communication for criminal investigations and they have to provide it to law enforcement agencies in readable format. What, what is specific about this is, is that in most of the countries, law enforcement need a court order for this. They need a court warrant. And it should be given against specific person for specific crime. And I think this is completely legitimate dema demand if, if we're talking about, about electronic data. So I do believe that the companies shall not allow the access to encryption techniques. They shall not allow the access to master keys. They shall not provide the back door to encryption. Here we have full stop. When it's about crime investigations, when it's about legitimate demands of the law enforcement agencies, which are submitted with a due process, with the safeguards, with court orders, of course, governments, law enforcement, should be allowed to access data for, the, for, for, for legitimate purposes. Let me start by saying that there is absolutely no other way of saying it, at, uh, and which is that a, a, a weaker encryption system is definitely no excuse for anything. It does not solve any problems. It does not provide any solutions to anything. A weaker encryption system means that anybody can exploit it, be it the government or the criminal elements or other groups in the world. So that, that's why. Also, you know, I've been hearing this debate uh, here at the IGF that whether or not there should be a, uh, there should be this idea that a backdoor should be built in an encryption system for governments and law enforcement agencies to use that. And I, and I feel this debate truly lacks a global perspective because when we say government as a stakeholder, we need to understand that not all the governments around the world are same. There are governments who are responsible and who are involved in actively bombing their citizens as well. There are governments in the world who are actively involved in threatening journalists, killing them, threatening human rights defenders, killing them, and so on. So we need to understand that such a power, which is given to law enforcement agencies or the government, can definitely be used against them. And we, we, have, seen this, we, you know, we have seen this happening in Pakistan for a very long time. And I think for me, there is, there is this other point that it's, it's not really about this debate between security and privacy anymore. It's not about privacy. So if, if you want access to my phone, it's not just privacy for me. It's not just my private messages. It's my bank account number. It's, it's 10 other applications that I'm using. It's uh, 10 other forms of data that I have on it. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's various other. So that, that is security for me. That's, that, that is a security for citizens. So essentially what we are talking about is security versus security and not security versus privacy. So that is another, uh, I think, element we need to consider in our, uh, in our debate because I think one of the things that's just been highlighted is that every country has a sort of very complex set of, you know, whether it's norms or legal framework or requirements or whatever it is. Um, and so our operators in each country have to deal with that as they operate their networks in every country. However, that's, that's sort of more the policy side of stuff. But from a technical point of view, the, the technical stuff works, right? It works, it's very, you know, it's very specific. And yes, we would love to see nerds nerding harder, that's awesome. But, um, but it, it doesn't matter, it's, it's the tension we always have. It's sort of super, it's super uh, jurisdiction, right? It's international, it's global, it's all that. And I think one of the things that this conversation is going towards is kind of addressing both those issues. And I think that's a really, really good point. But it's something that we see all the time. And it's something that I find challenging when I go and work in the standards areas in a policy with a policy hat on. It's a very, it's a very difficult thing. So I would ask you, and I would challenge you to say, what would you need from us, from a policy, from a government, from a framework point of view, to make your life uh, easier in some ways? But the fact is that no matter where you are, companies are not set up to reliably be defenders of civil liberties. They, they're just that's not what they're in business to do. You know, their interests change at any time. Their obligations to you are limited by what they put in the user licenses that no one bothers to read. Um, and even if you want to argue that a company like Apple has our best interests at heart, um, what if the technology fails? What if we are getting our civil liberties from Apple and um, not everyone can afford Apple technology? Well, wealthy people have more civil liberties than, than other people. This is why I think it, it does come back to institutions and, and we, need to, we need to nurture our civic institutions, reform them, and you know, in countries where, these, where, these, where this doesn't exist, the technology is really a secondary question.